Hey there, my name's Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. I've done two previous videos about RAM management, one about how much RAM do you need in an Android phone for 2022 and another one about uh, iPhones, how much RAM do you really need in an iPhone. And this is the third video, the comparison, comparing RAM management and RAM usage on an iPhone to that of Android. So if you want to find out more, please well, let me explain. <laughs> Okay, so way back in the day, RAM in both Android and iOS were very, very similar. So for example, the HTC Dream, the first official Android phone had 192 megabytes, megabytes, and the original iPhone and the one after that had 128 megabytes. Now after that, things kind of started to double uh, every year, 256, 512, until we get to around 2012, when the Galaxy S3 has one gigabyte and the iPhone 5 has one gigabyte. So as you can see, in the early days, things were very, very similar. However, with the launch of the Galaxy S3, there were also some variants that had two gigabytes. And in fact, the next year when the Galaxy S4 came out, it came with two gigabytes across all of its models, while the iPhone remained at one gigabyte. In fact, the iPhone remained at one gigabyte for another two years until you get to the iPhone 6S. So here we can see a divergence where the iPhone was increasing the amount of RAM less than what was happening in the Android ecosystem. And today, what do we see? Well, we can see that most iPhones have kind of four gigabytes. The iPhone 13 Pro has six gigabytes. And in the Android, well, of course, you get plenty of six gigabytes, plenty of eight gigabytes Android phones. But the way at the top end, you've got 12 gigabytes and even 16 gigabytes. Now, as a result, a lot of people would make a statement like iPhones need less RAM. And that's true. And we're going to look at that. But they tend to tag on at the end kind of comma because it's better optimized. And it has absolutely nothing to do with optimization. There seems to be this kind of idea that optimization is magic over in uh, kind of Apple's uh, camp, but other companies don't know anything. Nothing to do with that. It has got something to do with Java and with Objective-C or Swift, and that's what we're gonna look at now. So when a developer writes an app for a smartphone, it needs to write it in a programming language. Now on the iPhone, that programming language is either Objective-C or Swift. And it's the traditional uh, kind of approach to programming that you write some source code, you compile it, and then the result is a binary, an app that runs natively on the processor. What do you mean by natively? It means that the instructions that are given to the processor, the, the processor understands. That's how the processor is built. The compiler built that program specially for that chip. And of course, it wouldn't run on an AMD or an Intel chip. It has to run on an Apple chip, and the Apple chip is based on the ARM architecture. Now, over in the Android world, things are slightly different. Way back in the day, a decision was made to use Java. So that means Java or today Kotlin. Now, Java is different to, for example, Objective-C or Swift. It doesn't compile down to native code. It compiles down to an intermediate language. In this case, it's called a Java bytecode. Now, the advantage of compiling down to an intermediate language is that that program can run on many, many, many different devices. So, of course, you get Java on a PC, you get Java on your smartphone, you can have Java on a tablet, you can have Java on a Raspberry Pi, you can have Java kind of in a smart TV. I mean, kind of the slogan for Java is write once, run everywhere. And that's the basically the idea. Because you go down to this common language, this intermediate language, then you don't need to compile once for an ARM chip, once for an Intel chip, once for some other kind of chip. You all work down at this middle level. However, the disadvantage to run all those different platforms, you need what's called a runtime environment, a way of taking that bytecode and running it on the actual processor that you need. And that's called the Java Virtual Machine. And basically that is a way of translating this bytecode into the native code. Now, obviously when you do that in a kind of a uh, dynamic fashion that you just read the next bit of bytecode, run it, read the next bit of bytecode, then that can actually be quite slow. You've added in an extra layer of interpretation. Now, there are various techniques, including just-in-time compiling, ahead-of-time compiling, that try to take that Java code and convert it or in the, on the device itself into an actual native binary, or at least chunks of it into a native binary. And that's what Android does, depending on all the history of it. There's a whole history of the different kind of Java virtual machines. But you get this idea, these techniques to take that Java code and convert it into something much more close to the native code. However, 
However, those techniques are brilliant and the people there, and I've spoken to some of the engineers that work on this, they do everything they can to make that as best as possible. The fact that you still have to have this runtime environment, you have to deal with bytecode, you have to deal with the whole way that Java runs as a language, it still means that the Java code uses more memory. It's not so much about performance, but it uses more memory. So what I did was I took an iPhone and I took an Android phone and I ran lots and lots of popular apps, Gmail for example, to see what the size of it is in memory on an iPhone and what the size of it in memory is on an Android phone. And this is what I found out. So for example, if you take the Google Play Store or the iTunes Store, you can see they're roughly the same size, slightly bigger actually on iOS, but not much in it. However, if you take something like Acrobat Reader for reading uh, PDF files, you can see it takes 117 megabytes in RAM for reading the same document this is on iOS, but 390 megabytes are on Android. In fact, as you go down the list here, you're gonna see that most apps are actually bigger on, uh, on Android, in memory we're talking about. So for classic one here, Twitter, 100 megabytes on iOS, 366 megabytes there on Android. And all of this testing, I tried as much as I can to replicate exactly the same thing. So I logged into the same account, looked at the same emails, read the same documents. So I was trying as best as I can to make it exactly the same experience on both devices. Now you can see there are some cases where the Android uh, apps are up to 70% bigger in memory than the iOS ones. Particularly when you look at booking.com and ebay.com, they tend to be kind of web interfaces in a mobile phone and they seem to use up a lot of memory. But even things like Gmail, Twitter, as I said, do use up more memory. So on average, uh, Android apps are 40% larger in terms of memory usage than iOS uh, phones. So that basically means that if you had an iPhone with you know, six gigabytes of memory, you're gonna need 40% more in an Android phone to get the same level of memory management, the same number of apps remaining in memory. So really six gigabytes on the iPhone is equivalent to kind of eight gigabytes on an Android phone, even more if the particular apps you use a lot are actually, you know, in that 70% bracket like we saw with Booking.com and eBay. Now, some of you might be saying, oh no, that's not true. It's not because of the Java virtual machine. It's not because of native code versus you know, intermediate code. It's because just Android is rubbish. Well, actually no, because if you look at games, and games tend to be written natively on both Android and iOS, if you take Unity, if you take Unreal, if you take some of the other game development kits, when they compile their code, they compile to native on both iOS and on Android. So there's no UI that, you know, with the widgets that you get for Android, there's no all the Android underlying libraries and frameworks you're using, you're just compiling down to native code because really it's a game. All you want is access to the display and to write things and, and to use the GPU and get things on that screen as fast as possible. So I did exactly the same test looking at some of the popular games to see what the difference was in size of memory usage for iOS compared to Android. So as you can see here, it's a bit of a mixed bag. So for example, Subway Surfers on iOS takes up 500 megabytes, whereas it takes up 761 megabytes uh, on Android. Whereas if we go to uh, something like Brawl Stars, well, that's 572 megabytes on iOS and 507 on Android. So less on Android and certainly uh, they're similar, but certainly not more as we see in other cases. But if you take Minecraft, 462 megabytes on iOS, 803, so almost double uh, on Android. But then if you go to Shadowgun Legends, 1.1 gigabytes on iOS, only 900 megabytes uh, on Android. So because we're dealing with native on both now iOS and on Android, we can see now that the games are very, very similar in sizes. In fact, if you take the average, it's about 10%. So Android games are about 10% bigger. However, as I showed, there are cases where Android games are actually smaller. And once you kind of get into 10%, then other factors are coming in. You talk about compiler versions, textures, texture resolution, texture compression, screen resolutions, you know, OpenGL ES versus Metal, all these other kind of things where that 10% can kind of, you know, be argued one way or another. But it's certainly very different to the situation that we have with apps. So this just shows us that as an operating system in general, Android and iOS, there's not much between them when you're writing native code. 
Now, of course, memory is a finite resource. So on Android and on iOS, whether it's games or apps, what happens is when you start a new game or app, a space has to be found in memory. If there is free memory, the app or game can be loaded into it. Now, at some point, there is, because it's a finite resource, there won't be enough. You've got all these other apps running, all these other games running, and there won't be enough space. Now, both Android and iOS do exactly the same thing in this situation. They try to compress some of the memory that's already being used. So both Android and iOS will look at all the memory. It's called pages. They divide them up into blocks called pages. And it says, well, that page hasn't been used for quite a while. It chances are it's not gonna be used, so I'll compress it. So it takes that page, compresses it, let's say 50% compression, if you can get that, and then puts it back into memory, which 50% of that space has now become free. And if you do that enough, you can start to free yourself up 10, 20, 30, 40, 100 megabytes, 200 megabytes, and now you've got enough space to launch this new game or app. And Android and iOS do exactly the same thing. They do it in different ways. On Android, it's called you know ZRAM, so it's swapping to compress memory. Uh, iOS has its uh, memory compression uh, algorithms, but basically the same idea. You compress memory so that you can squeeze in others. And both of them have to decompress that memory if it wants to access that page again. So it picked a page, it said, oh, I'm gonna compress that. And then later on, if you swap to that app, it does actually have to take that page, decompress it before it can be used. Same on both systems. And both systems will try to compress as much as they can on when nothing else can be compressed, when it doesn't make any sense to compress anything because it's, it's so new or there is no more compression to be done, then both of them resort to killing off other apps. And I talked about this in depth in both my Android and my iOS video. There gets to a point in both operating systems where it says I've got nothing else to do, I have to kill an app. It's called killing or terminating an app on Android, jettisoning an app on iOS, they get booted out of memory and then their free space is then used to load the new app. Now I've covered in detail how many apps you can have in memory, how many games you can have in memory in those previous two videos. It's worth pointing out this when it comes to apps on both the iPhone SE with only its three gigabytes and let's say a Pixel 3 XL with four gigabytes, you can run six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 apps all in memory at the same time and it's not a problem. So if you switch between you know, Twitter and Instagram and then to Gmail and then you know maybe one or two web pages, it's gonna be okay even with a small amount of RAM. Once you start running big games, for example, you know, Shadow Guns Legends I talk about, that's a gigabyte of memory. So that's obviously, you know, it's gonna take a huge chunk of the memory and iOS and Android will try to do things to accommodate your request to load up that game and to play it. And obviously the more memory you have, so when you do have eight, 12, 16 gigabytes of memory, then the more of those big games can be held uh, in RAM simultaneously. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is this, because iOS uses native compilers, Objective-C and Swift, the programs tend to be smaller when it comes to apps. That means for people who are use productivity apps, you can get away with less RAM in an iPhone. And so really a four gigabyte iPhone is okay, six gigabytes, is certainly uh, good for future proofing, and you're not going to have much problem switching between those apps. Same with Android, you know, four gigabytes is going to work, but it's going to be a struggle. Six gigabytes uh, is easy, and the basic the rule of thumb is this: it's 40% more. So if you've got an iPhone with four gigabytes, you need an Android phone with uh, six. Now, having said that, when it comes to games, of course, games take up big amounts of memory, and if you are a keen gamer and you switch between several games during a day, depending on you know whether you're waiting to catch a train or whether you're downtime at home or whatever it is that how you play the games, then maybe you're gonna to wanna to have more memory on both operating systems because both of them, Shadowgun Legend or Jensen Impact, they're big on both platforms and they're big to the kind of the same kind of size. There's not a big difference between them. So you're gonna need that extra memory. And this is where something like uh, the Galaxy S21 Ultra with 12 gigabytes is actually quite a sweet spot uh, on Android. Uh, as I said, uh, you kind of, eight gigabytes would work depending on the phone. Because one thing to notice about Android is because there are so many different manufacturers, they do tweak the versions of Android they use to kill off apps more aggressively or not. And I cover that in that Android video. So six gigabytes is certainly enough on an iPhone. Eight to 12 is certainly enough on an Android. And it all comes down to the fact that when you wanna run apps, that they are actually bigger on Android. But when you run games, they are pretty much both the same. Okay, that's it. My name's Gary Sims. This is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. Don't forget you can follow me on Twitter at Gary Explains. 
I also have a newsletter, go over to garyexplains.com, type in your email address, no spam, just a newsletter. Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.